This is a Pinball News Production. We're here in South Wales at the Highway Pinball Factory with Andrew Highway. And Andrew, um, last time we saw you was just before you went to Pinball Expo and FestiFlip in France for those two big shows. Can you tell us a little bit about how those went? Yeah, hi Martin, hi to everybody at Pinball News. Um, yeah, they went very well. It was um, Chicago in particular was um, our opportunity to take a fully working game over to, to the US for the first time and to be able to connect directly with customers in front of Full Throttle. And it really it was uh, an amazing experience for us. We had some amazingly positive feedback. And uh, most importantly, our game performed very well over the three day, over the four days of the event, and uh, we had very few technical issues. So we had a lot of positivity about um, a lot of the USPs that we have in our game, like the illuminated side panels, just how fast the game played, especially as it's a white wood as well. Um, how much they enjoyed the shot flow and the shot geometry, uh, how fun the rules were as well. I mean, really, we couldn't have asked for um, a better reaction from uh, our trip over to the USA. And this was our second trip to France as well, when we went to Flip Expo. And we had a much improved version of the game than we had done at the previous year. And again, um, yeah, feedback was very, very good. But I have to say, um, from all the events that we did, um, it, was really, it was really amazing to feel the, um, the passion, the enthusiasm that Americans have for something which is traditionally Americana of pinball machines and it was great for us to be able to show them our product. Okay, now last time we came down to see you, um, it may look very similar to, to viewers, but in fact we're in a completely different factory now. Can you tell us a little bit about where we are now, how it's different to the previous factory, and and why you moved the uh, whole distance of about 100 yards? <laughs> well, the reason why we moved was, um, as, as I'm sure many of your viewers know now, that, that we actually did um, a project for, or, or a job for Bacardi, the, the biggest privately drinks, uh, owned drinks company in the world. And we made 251 games for Bacardi within a four and a half month period. And that's from design through to production through to the finished version. And we learned a lot about the whole production and development process with this game. But the one thing that became very clear at a very early stage was just that we were going to run out of space very, very quickly in our old factory. Now, that factory had 14,000 square feet of factory space. Well, it's actually 10,000 of factory space and 4,000 of office space. But it became very clear that with that game, we were running out of space very quickly. And bearing in mind pinball there's a lot more parts that need to be added uh, need to be stored bought in you need a lot more space to actually produce the games you're not just making the play fields you're making the cabinets assembly stations it became very clear we were not going to be able to fulfill our ambitions with the factory space that we had so yes we've moved to um two units in fact only less than actually i believe it's about 30 or 40 yards from our old factory and we've gone from 10,000 square foot of factory space to 41,000 square foot of space so we have absolutely all the space we need now to be able to do full-scale production of our games and presumably moving from one factory to another takes a little bit of time uh, yes. and in order to set everything up again. How has that impacted on the production schedule? And, and, and what is the production schedule now? now? When are you going to be building games? How many games do you think you'll be building? Well, as far as the actual move was concerned, we actually had to plan this very carefully because we didn't want to reach a stage where we'd started production and then we had to go and move factories. So we decided to make the move at a time when we were least active within the factory, which was when we were doing the shows, firstly at uh, Pinball Expo in Chicago and then at Flip Expo in France. So during that period, um, I had staff here who were, who were moving items Items across from one factory to the other factory so a lot by the time we'd actually come back from both shows most of the move had actually been completed and it took us about another one and a half two to two weeks to finish to finally complete the move now as far as production schedules goes um, we're targeting starting production before the end of January 2015 and we're looking to have an, an initial production run of 20 machines this is 24 throttles after that at the end of February we expect the production process to take approximately four weeks uh, for our first game and then after that we expect to make 50 games between the end of February and the end of March, and then we increase production um, as the year progresses from there. So the start of production more or less ties in with the EAG show in London. Um, I know you're planning to have a, a, a reasonably sized mm -hmm. stand there. Can you tell us a little bit about your plans for that? Absolutely. Well, I mean, as far as EAG is the big international trade show on, in these waters, and so we really wanted to have a, a good showing there. So we've got a, an eight and a half metre by two metre stand where we plan to have four full throttles on display. Now, we have two games in existence at the moment. One is in Florida on its way back, and the other one is here at our factory. And as you see in the background here, we have our brand new cabinets made we're assembling new play fields as we speak and these games three and four will be ready in time for expo so we will have four games on our stand at EAG. 
And I understand you're also planning to do some kind of promotional event that will be taking place straight after EAG. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely, yes. Well, this will actually be our official launch party and launch event for Full Throttle. Now, this is going to be the EAG shows the 13th to the 15th of January at the Excel in London. And our official launch event and launch party are the day after, which is Friday the 16th of January 2015 at the Pipeline Bar in central London. And effectively, it's a two-stage event. The launch event is um, all about connecting with customers, potential customer, customers, operators, distributors. And then the evening event is much more of a party atmosphere, letting your hair down, having a couple of drinks. We'll have some tournaments there with some prizes. But also, the band that plays the music for our game, Redline, will be performing uh, from their album Vice, including, of course, the, the very famous King of the Mountain, which is one of the feature tracks on our game. They will be performing at 9pm that evening too. So this is our our, effectively, this is our official launch event and launch party. So this is open to the public in the evening then, is Absolutely it? Absolutely it is. It's, um, it's on a ticketing only basis, so people have to uh, go to our website or email us to reserve their positions. Um, and yeah, we're, we're expecting it to be a very busy affair. Excellent. Well, you mentioned just now about there being some, some changes to the cabinets mm-hmm. uh, in the new games that you're building up. I see they're, they're behind you here. Can yes. you show us some of, the, some of the new features? Absolutely. Well, we've been experimenting with new materials for our cabinets too. Uh, what you see here is you see a matte black finish, which is what will be on the, uh, the standard edition of our games. And you see over here, you, there's a red gloss finish, which will be uh, one of the two finishes available on the limited edition versions of games. Now, you see these cut-out holes here. Um, this is actually where the, uh, the foil has come into uh, the gap. But this, is mach- this will be machined out, and then you have infill sections here, which have the flipper buttons on them. So again, this all falls into line with the modularity of our system, whereby you can remove the plates with the flippers on them. You can even uh, give an additional uh, flipper plate with two flipper buttons on it if a game desired it. And it's the same concept at the front of the cabinet too. So whereas, for example, on full throttle, this will have an auto-launch button here. On future games, there could well be a plunger. So you would just give a new plate with a plunger for future games. Uh, So there's a lot of things that we've been experimenting with here um, from our last version of cabinet. It was very much MDF based, but we wanted to have um, a ply base. It's a much better quality product to work with on a pinball cabinet. So this is now an in-applied cabinet. And what it means is is we've been been able to save a lot on the overall weight of the game too. And also what you can see here at the sides, this is a further development of our um, our lighted side panel um, art translight, if you like, system, where it's a very easy system. You simply, if you notice here at the top, there is a gap in between the, um, the inner ply shell of the cabinet and the outer foil wrapped finish, if you like, and the gap in between is where the artwork panel slips into it. So this all comes down to the modularity of being able to change games into existing cabinets in a very small period of time. I mean, we estimate it's going to be no longer than 10 minutes to be able to change a game completely, which is the, the back glass, the side panels, the software on the USB stick, and of course the play field itself, so you have a new game in your cabinet in less than 10 minutes. And the other thing, actually, I wanted to tell you one thing about this cabinet too, is that, for example, you see a lot of used games now which may be 10, 20 years old, and they're starting to look quite battered, the cabinets. The way we actually have built our system here is that if, let's say, one of the cabinets was to become damaged on site or maybe just due to general wear and tear over the course of the years, the cabinet's starting to look a bit scruffy further down the line. Well, with our system here, you'll actually be able to buy an upgrade package consisting of the outer panels which can fit onto the pinball machine. So you can completely tidy and spruce up your pinball machine by buying the side panels, the front panel, and replacing it. You can even change it to a different finish to match, for example, the decor in your room. Okay, and you've still got the illuminated side panels with LEDs at the top and the bottom. bottom. And the bottom. Okay, excellent. Okay, so that's not the only change. You've uh, also now got a a new member of the Highway Pinball team, a well-known designer. Can you Absolutely. tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, I mean, it gives me great pleasure to um, say that we have a new addition to our team now. Uh, this man um, has been... Um, I've been a huge fan of his, of his and his work over the years. I have a number of his games in my collection. And um, ever since he was a guest at my um, show, the UK Pinball Party, we discussed the possibility of him joining our team and making games for us. So it gives me great pleasure to announce that Barry Ausler, world-famous pinball designer, has joined our ranks and is uh, one of our official game designers. And can you tell us a little bit about what, what Barry's going to be doing? Is he going to be designing games? Is he going to be working on other, other designs? Is he going to be helping out 
Uh, he's not physically going to be in the fact working in the factory. So, uh, so how's his uh, contribution going to going to help Highway Pinball? Well, Barry's going to be um, first. Uh, sorry, Barry's going to be first and foremost designing one particular game in our schedule, which is due for release towards the end of next year. So that's one aspect of the work Barry will be doing. The second aspect is he will also be helping and consulting us on various aspects of our current designs as well. I mean, it's it's not a, a it's not it hasn't been unusual in history of pinball that you actually have more than one designer collaborating on a game's design. In some case, two or three game designers have worked on one pinball machine. So uh, Barry's also going to be helping us out with our current models designs, which, are in the, which we're developing at the moment. Okay, so we've had a look at Full Throttle. We've also spoken a little bit about Barry's design, Game 4. But down here on the factory floor, we have a, a rather special piece of wood which um, um, I'll leave it to you to describe exactly what it is that we're looking at here. <laughs> well, this um, was uh, collected this morning, actually, um, the, on the morning of Friday, and uh, this is actually the Alien Whitewood. So this is the, um, the first um, iteration of the Alien Whitewood playfield. Uh, the playful design, of course, as um, your readers will know, uh, was done by Dennis Nordman. And um, we're at the stage now where this is being collected, and uh, we're going, we have board guides... Um, in the pipeline at the moment. We're expecting them within the, the first 10 or 12 days of January and also a mock-up of the ramp too. And we're going to be uh, testing all of the shot geometry within the first two weeks of January before we go to the shows. And of course, from that point then, we'll have learned a lot and, um, and then we'll start to make a, another version, which probably at that stage will not actually be a white wood, so it could actually be art on that. But the most important thing at the moment is this is our alien white wood as it stands and um, it's ready to be built up and uh, to be tested. OK, you mentioned about Dennis's involvement in the game. There was a fairly public announcement from him last week about uh, the ending of his involvement in the, in the creation of this game. Can you tell us what it is that he's, he's done and how the game moves on from here? Sure. Um, well, Dennis um, came on at the start. So Dennis um, came, on to the, uh, came on board with this design process um, over a year ago now. In fact, um, it was probably about... Uh, maybe about 15, 16 months at this stage. And, um, and the main goal with Dennis was that, I mean, Dennis is a, is a genius pinball designer and uh, he's created many, many great games in the past. And I always had huge respect for Dennis. And when Dennis came over as a guest of my show, UK Pinball Party, a number of years ago, uh, we discussed the possibility maybe of uh, designing a game together at some point. So I was very happy when Dennis came on board. And you know, the main goal for us was to be able to have you know, Dennis's magic on the play field, if you like. So <clears throat> as to what a, a impact Dennis has had on this, Dennis um, created the initial playfield design, which we have uh, now gone and built. Uh, Dennis also uh, created a lot of the toys that you'll be seeing on Alien Pinball 2. And also Dennis had some sort of impact as well on the, on the rules too, which we've put together, the rules package. So Dennis has had a very big um, imprint on this game. But of course, you know, um, designers, there's only a, a certain number of top play, uh, pinball designers in the world, and Dennis has other projects he's working on. So, you know, we're very happy with the contribution Dennis has got, uh, has given to us. And, um, you know, development has, has improved and increased from there. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that development process because you're quite unusual in the way that you create games in that you start off with a, with a white wood or start off with a playful design, but then you transfer it over to a computer simulation and develop the rules and the lighting and sound effects on that before you start applying that to the hardware. Uh, can you tell us exactly how that process works and, and why you chose to go that route? Well, one of the things people, um, just to sort of link in with what you've just said there, one of the things people are surprised about sometimes is the time frames that we give that it will take us to actually develop a game. But from the very start of this whole process, we wanted to build, a, uh, we wanted to develop a game which would be very easy to build from our side, would be very easy to service in the long term uh, from, uh, from operators and from collectors too. Um, but this whole, um, how we could speed up the whole process um, expanded into other areas as well. For example, as you said, the virtual game side of things. It means that what we can do is at the same time that we are developing a whitewood as we are here, for example, making sure the shots work and do the adjustments there. At the same time as that, we can work on a digital platform and already be working on rules, lighting, sound effects, integration of video, graphics such as uh, interactive dashboards and so on so you can actually develop a number of different items of the game at the same time which can really um, which really save you a lot of time further down the road so from our side of things you know we're looking at um, trying to have this game into production at some stage in April that might sound very short but we actually have a fully playable version of our game on the digital platform at the moment and although currently that focus is more on the aliens the second film we are building in the alien rule set into that as well because of course our game focuses on the two 
two films and how you, you participate in that universe. So we are still very confident. As I said, you know, we're ready to start um, testing our white wood within the first couple of weeks of January and development is, is happening very quickly. Okay, and, and talk about Alien and Aliens. There's been quite a lot of discussion recently and um, maybe some controversy about the whole licensing issue and uh, the, the use of assets and rights to, uh, to show certain things on the game or not. Can you tell us how your, your experiences of working with licensors to, to well, in this particular case for uh, Alien and working with uh, Fox on this? Well, I think the, the one thing that became very clear when I approached um, Fox uh, about having a license for Alien, and this was also with the, um, with the aid of Roger Sharp as well, and Roger helped us uh, throughout this process with this game, is that Fox are obviously are very passionate about their license. You know, it's a hugely successful license. And, of course, any license, license saw um, is going to want to protect the intellectual property that they've you know, spent so much money to go and develop. And so it's really a case of, of just trying to respect the fact that a licensor wants to protect the intellectual property, but you know, they're not doing it to be difficult. They're doing it because you know, they want us to, provide, to develop a brilliant game on one side, but at the same time, something that respects their intellectual property. So you know, it's been great working with Fox so far. We've really enjoyed the experience. But you know, the one thing that we have learned so far already is that you, know, you just have to be very careful about what you show the public. Clearly, you can't go and show artwork and features which are not approved. So you know, we, we've got a very vigilant process. We work very closely with Fox. And, you know, sometimes these things can take more time than you would imagine they would do, because it's not just one person, for example, that would sign off on everything on a game. It might be somebody who signs off from the music side of things, or someone that signs off on the visuals, or, or on, on the artwork as well. There's a, many difficult and different processes involved in the licensing process. So, um, you know, it, it's a challenge, of course it is, because, um, you know, you have to, to deal with lots of different people and their interpretations of intellectual property as well. But, uh, you know, we're very happy with our relationship with Fox and um, and you know, I should say as well that uh, you know, we're working with two other licensing bodies too because games three and four that we are working on, uh, these are license issues as well. So we, you, know, you run into the same sorts of issues with each licensor. And as long as you, know, you respect um, their rules and you respect the way that they want to handle things, then it should be a smooth relationship. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Andrew, for showing us around the factory here and, and showing us the new features and the new Whitewood for Aliens. It's a pleasure. Alien you. Pinball, the 35th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll be back soon with lots more from Highway Pinball. Uh, in the meantime, wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to wish all your readers as well, and also the followers of our pinball site and all of our customers, we'd like to wish everybody a Happy Christmas and a Happy New Year as well.